uh, on behalf of the dais fogs and all our partner organizations uh, it is such a honor uh, for me to welcome all of you to this uh, critical uh, celebration of the united nations day on 24th of october uh, the un day as we all call it as i have uh, called it fondly for for the last 10 years once i found out properly about the united nations is a special day to us because as an organization and people we are deeply committed and inspired by the un charter to begin with the message of uh, of peace that it brings about dignity about development access to that development and equality that it talks about so right from there to the sustainable development goals how we are the beneficiaries of that entire uh, mammoth effort by the united nations so today to have a uh, to have fix our representatives un staff representatives join us gives us a true sense of celebration uh, with the people who make it happen uh, who have committed their lives to it and are the true role models who are sometimes behind the screens and sometimes uh, in front of the screens uh, to to really make this this organization uh, the pro probably the biggest uh, impact making organization in the world um uh, to run despite their personal challenges despite their own set of logistical challenges that that are presented to them every day so it is a, a really big honor for us and i on behalf of all of us uh, i am we are very lucky to have uh, to have every uh, speaker all from different agencies as well as uh, fixa and uh, and also we have two great great uh, moderators with us who are leading this discussion today uh, mr peter and miss jasmine and i will now uh, yield the floor to them and uh, and really really looking forward to this discussion in my personal capacity as a listener as well because it it will probably be a very insightful one thank you all thank you very much keshav um Normally, we would start any UN conference with distinguished delegates. May I ask you all to take your seats? And I'm assuming that everyone's taking their seats as we um, go ahead. Thank you all for joining us on this uh, web event. Um, we're very appreciative of you, and we're very happy and honoured to have you take part in this and show your interest to the UN. Um, it is a great pleasure that I welcome all of you here as we observe the 75th anniversary of the United Nations with this interesting topic, we, the people of the UN, myth versus reality, stories, experience, and perspectives from UN staff. In this celebration of United Nations Day, 24th of October. Um, before I get to introducing our distinguished panel members from the United Nations, it's great with great honor that I introduce my fellow moderator. My co-moderator, is a very dedicated, determined, and passionate professional. She is fiercely stoic and a solid defender of human rights. Gandhi said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Well, not this one, she is going to be loud. Raised in Delhi amongst brothers that sharpened her instinct and a very loving father who provided her with very wise words, she started searching for her own calling. My co-moderator saw that the best way to find herself was to lose herself in the service of others. She decided to work where it really matters, social work at grassroots level. It was here in the slums where she was working with those less privileged with her, sex workers and transsexual people that were subject to horrific conditions that she found her purpose. My co-moderator is a determined lady poised at making a change. She's leading in the global conversations on human rights issues related to gender and the LGBTQ community amongst others. She's also the convener of gender in the Dias Dialogue series. Ladies and gentlemen, on his visit to India, Pope Paul VI said, I met 100 people on the way to Delhi and everyone I met is my brother. I can say that I'm not on my way to Delhi yet, but I have already met one sister. Distinguished delegates, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my co-moderator, Ms. Jasmine Jose. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, to, to begin with, we just started talking a few days back uh, when we were asked to host the dialogue for today. 
but it felt as if it's been a long time since i know you it gives me immense pleasure to know that uh, my co moderator uh, peter to has a shared connection in terms of uh, studying in a school run by the selations and now very well can understand the reason uh, as to why uh, he when it comes to treating respect uh, treating others with respect and love we share the same values uh, peter shares the same belief of uh, lib uh, of learning from their own battles and liberate and this is what he ensures to use when uh, he needs to liberate others the way he connects with people through his words is an expertise he use, uses in his professional life as well by developing communication strategies uh, to foster community engagement and uh, developing partnerships across uh, across the globe his search for an identity and looking for an answer to why fueled his desire to works towards diplomacy since he closely felt that humans should not be confined or limited by geographical boundaries because we are all citizens of the world and not of a particular country if we need to define in one word who peter would be it would uh, the word best suited for him would be emancipator for me he is not just a co-host but someone i have found as a mentor to look forward to for the guidance in the coming days since it's very rare that we find people with the shared values and beliefs and the connection that we all uh, put together so welcome peter and looking forward to hosting the session with you today Thank you, Jasmine, for your kind words. We will now go to meeting our panel members. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Tanya. Tanya, could you give us some points about you, your nationality, your job and the organization and duty station you work at? Hi, Peter. Hi, Jasmine. Lovely Thank to you. join you all. Um, my name is Tanya Quinn McGuire. I'm Irish national, although I've lived for almost 30 years now in the Geneva area. I work for uh, the, I've worked on and off for different U UN agencies over those 30 years. And currently I'm the president of the Federation of International Staff Associations. Um, and I'm a UN AIDS staff member um, for the last 12 years. Thank you, lovely to be here. Thank you very much, Tanya. We'll dive into a few more questions later when we meet you. I'd like to now introduce Veronique. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning from Montreal, because I'm based in Montreal. So my name is Véronique Alain. They call me for Vero. Um, I'm both French by birth and Canadian by marriage. I live in Montreal. Uh, in Canada, I work for um, in one of the three Rio conventions, which is the Convention on Biological Div Diversity. It's called SCBD, Secretariat of the Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, I've had, uh, I've been working there for 21 and a half years, but before that I had World Bank experience and then I had uh, UNIDO in Vienna and then uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe. So I have some uh, international organizations background for a little bit more than about 30 years now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vero. Now I'd like to cross to Mogadishu and ask Ari please to introduce himself. Good morning, folks. Good morning or good afternoon, Peter, folks. Uh, my name is Ari Gaitanis. I'm from Australia of Greek-Spanish heritage. I'm currently, as you said, in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia. I've been here on and off for the past three years on assignment from UN headquarters in New York. I'm the chief of communications at the UN mission in Somalia at the moment. Thank you very much. Nice that you've joined us from Somalia. Uh, if we can now go to meet Rajesh. Namaste, good afternoon, good evening uh, for people wherever they are. I am Dr. Rajesh Mehta, a pediatrician by training. Uh, I have been uh, a civil servant all my life, it seems. After spending time in uh, Government of India, I joined uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, for the last 15, 16 years. I am working for Child and Adolescent Health in the Southeast Asia Regional Office of WHO at uh, New Delhi. I am happy to be here. Thanks a lot. See you. Thank you, Rajesh. We look forward to hearing from you later. Then I'd like to move to Gemma. 
Thank you, Peter. Good uh, afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Gemma Vessel. I'm Filipino by birth. I'm also American, lived in the US for 20 years. I'm actually here stationed in Geneva and I've been here for almost 20 years as well. I work as a legal officer, uh, technical legal officer at the World Health Organization. And um, I was the former general secretary of FIXA. Thank you very much, Gemma. And last but not least, uh, Leila, could you introduce yourself? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leila Manley Spain, as Peter's already said. I am a peacekeep peacekeeping training officer by profession. Um, <laughs> I have a very diverse background, started off as an accountant, and now ended up in peacekeeping and training. I'm a certified trainer. I am serving currently as the vice president of the UN Field Staff Union, where I'm on assignment from in Brindisi, Italy. My parent station, very similar to one of our panel members, is actually the United Nations Support Office in Somalia, but I am based in Nairobi usually until now of course and now i am here and happy to be part of this session thank you for having me thank you very much Leila. so um i hope our audience gets to see and appreciate that we've got a really bright bright, bright wide range of um speakers from all around the world from all different nationalities and um really represent the un so um we're looking forward to diving in and hearing more from them um i'm gonna pass the microphone over to jasmine Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, moving ahead with the session, um, I would like to introduce a certain code of conduct that we uh, that we use to ensure uh, a healthy discussion. Uh, we are committing to have the event as a safe, inclusive, and encouraging space for the diversity of people, opinions, and ideas. And therefore, we request all the speakers and participants to help us maintain the same. Any derogatory remarks or comments on the members of the panel or any political or insensitive remarks will not be entertained. So we kindly request you to uh, be mindful of the language we are using on the platform. We have a strict no tolerance policy for cyberbullying and harassment on any basis and the technical moderator reserves the right to remove the participant found guilty of any such behavior. We promote compassion, love, and collaboration as values and hope to have your support in the same. There is a mindful implementation of child protection policy and data privacy protection policy for all the participants uh, and the partners who are present. All the participants are requested to keep themselves on mute unless it is their turn to speak. The raise hand feature on Zoom may be used if any one of you wishes to engage and the moderators shall take due note of the same. You can engage through the chat window option on Zoom as well to have a healthy discussion and contribute to your sharings and insights. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Jasmine. So let's get down to work and let's dive in and speak to some of our distinguished panel members. We're going to start with Tanya. So Tanya, first of all, congratulations, Madam President, on your election to the president of FIXA. With this role, we wanted to ask you, are you the first female to have this position? And also we want to have, look about, look and speak to you about how you see gender and what your goals are for gender in your tenure. Thanks, Peter, for the question. Um, yes, I apparently I am the first uh, president, female president of FIXA. We've had quite a couple of uh, general secretaries uh, who are female, one of whom is Gemma, who's joined us today. Um, but no, I'm the first president. I'm quite humbled and quite proud of that, I have to say. Um, what do I see as my gender goals for the tenure? Gosh, I have quite a few. Um, for me, gender is um, is part of human rights. Um, you know, so I, where I we're working towards human rights for all, um, gender is going to be part of that. But I suppose the most obvious one for me is that I'd like to ensure that the role of president is seen going forward as a gender neutral role. That any other female staff representatives 
won't think, think twice before putting themselves forward. Um, and our members uh, won't think twice, won't think, um, should I vote for that woman? They will actually think, should I vote for that person? Because that person is the most competent person. So it's a bit of an obvious one, but it actually, um, I really hope that I, that the next woman who stands for president um, doesn't have to face questions of, well, you're a woman, will you get on with another woman? Um, and, and those types of questions. Um, so if we can, we can achieve, people can see that I'm just another person, I'm competent, I'm, I'm neither male nor female, I am just Tanya doing uh, what I hope is a decent job. That to me will be a great achievement already. Thank you for your insights to that. And um, how do you see um, your role as president as you move forward um, um, looking at COVID and other things, um, will you be um, making any special address or any needs to the women in there? I mean, how have women been impacted by COVID in the UN? And um, is there a difference between UN staff workers female and the UN staff workers male and how COVID has impacted them? Wow, that's a, that's a lot of questions all at once. Um, <laughs> um, how, well, why don't we just focus in on then, um, how has COVID then impacted um, the UN staff force? So maybe we can look at comparisons a bit later. Sure, I think um, I think COVID has impacted us as staff um, pretty much like every all of us around the world. Um, uh, you know, suddenly being um, told that you're working from home, um, that you're cut off from your natural. Uh, support systems, um, both socially and, and otherwise, it has been quite a bit of a shock for people and there's been a lot of adjustments. I do think that um, uh, our female colleagues have been affected um, disproportionately, um, as is the case the world over. I think we're seeing those studies the world over. Um, traditionally, women are seen as caregivers. Um, traditionally, um, society expects women to look after the children and look after the elderly and sick parents and people around us and and, and um you know we, we the, the the staff of the un are, are are just people like everyone else and we have we face those societal norms that are thrust upon us um as much as anyone else is um we're hoping that we've worked with the administrations to ensure that there's flexible flexibility that we bring in flexible working arrangements that um we have gender neutral policies. We talk about parental versus maternity or paternity leave um, so that it's not it so that we try to within our own workplace break down those societal norms and try to um, make it much more of a gender neutral and much more of an inclusive work workplace going forward. Thank you, Tanya, for that. Um, now, Going back a little bit about your your um, role as president, did you have any role models as you were, let's say, well, not particularly maybe going for prison, but you know, looking into entering the UN as a as a a way for a, as a vocation? Uh, maybe our audience would be interested in knowing, like, did, did you have any role models that you looked up to or you aspired to? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, like. And many people I'm sure that are tuning in today, I looked to people like the, um, the great aspirational role models of um, Nelson Mandela, um, Kofi Annan um, is one of my, um, one of my all time um, inspirational. I'm looking for my list of people actually, I had quite a few down, but um, Mary Robinson for me as an Irish woman to see um, the first Irish president elected, uh, female president elected on my first time to vote as an adult was, was quite inspirational for me. And, the, and Mary Robinson has gone on to work in the UN and work for, um, to be the high commissioner um, in the UN and then is, is now one of the elders um, who, and she continues that work. So for me, she's a great role model. You know, she's just a, continued down her path she's forged a path for other women and she's continued down that path but also I have to say um, more importantly for me are my everyday role models and um, those would have been my grandmother who was the first, a founding member of the Women's Workers Union of Ireland my mother 
who was, uh, you know, who smuggled condoms into conservative 1960s Ireland to talk about birth control at a time when these things were totally frowned upon. And also, I even look to my daughters today, who consistently, they're adults now, surprise me um, when they stand up and, and they make their opinion count and ensure that, um, you know, that their opinion is as important as others. And they're not above anyone else, but they're definitely not below anybody else either. And I find inspiration from all of that. And I have to say, your introduction earlier about Jasmine is, is making Jasmine one of my new role models. So uh, they're, they're, every day I find new role models, to be honest. That is encouraging to know that there, that each one of us could be a role model for, for someone else. Um, and in vain, in light of that question, I think I'm going to ask on behalf of uh, one of our audience members, Yusuf Balak from Pakistan. He asked, he asked actually a few questions. I'm going to go to his last part of the question. He said, how would Tanya tell us to be a perfect inspiration for everyone? I mean, you've touched a few things there. So how would you be a perfect inspiration? Thank you, Yusuf, for that question. Wow, that's um, that's a big one. Um, first of all, I balk at the word perfect. Um, I think anybody who knows me uh, would know I'm, I'm perfectly imperfect. And um, I've learned to live with that. And, um, and I hope that that actually is uh, a role model to other people. I'm an ordinary person. I'm an ordinary administrative staff member. I've stayed true to myself um, go in, in all my life, in, in life in general, but in, in my work in the UN. And even at times when that's difficult and that didn't make me a very popular person, when I had to remind um, administration that they should be walking the talk in our own UN workplace, it's not exactly the easiest path to walk, but I've stayed true to that and I've stayed true to those principles. And um, I've also learned that, you know, the people in high places are just like you and I, they, they are people and they, they are as imperfect as I am uh, or as the rest of us are, but we can still, it, just because we're imperfect doesn't mean that we can't strive to do good with what we have. Um, and I hope that the imperfection will help me um, to, to, to show other people that you don't need to be perfect to make things happen in this world. You just need to be honest and decent and go for it. Thanks, Tanya. Yes, and knowing you personally as well, I can attest to you the wonderful imperfections that you have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm going to move into something uh, more about um, gender and the UN in specific. We're going to ask you more about gender spe specific or gender stereotyped occupations. So um, what is the UN doing to um, change or make efforts to break the gender stereotype of professions? For example, that females are secretaries and, you know, all security staff should be male. Um, is there anything that you can tell us about um, how the UN is working against those gender norms? Um, yeah, I, you know, a lot of those um, gender norms still uh, exist in the UN as elsewhere. Um, you know, I think in all my time in the UN, I know one driver that's a woman and it's it's a difficult thing for her to be um in in when she in in a hardship duty station when a male uh high ranking officials arrive and they expect a man to drive them so she's she's sort of been a bit of a trailblazer on that one and if she's listening in that's a, a big kudos to grace in uganda um but there's also you know um like everywhere else, the UN is addressing those issues. They're um, taking steps. We've got a, we've got a gender um, parity task force, and um, they're trying to take the approach. I mean, it's it's gone up and down whether you know whether uh, there's gender parity across across the organisations, but the approach is to make it a gender neutral workplace, um, which I think it, from a personal um, opinion and a personal perspective, I think that's a very sensible and pragmatic way to look at it. We're also trying to balance then with gender, we also have to balance um, general 
and ensure that we've made an inclusive workplace for all underrepresented groups um, and not just um, make it a male female um, sort of dynamic, you know, and it's not about numbers, it's about making uh, about modernizing um, the workforce about walking the talk within our own workplace. There is a long way to go, I have to say, and I think that particularly where there's a lot of effort being made at the higher levels to make sure that um, senior uh, senior UN officials are uh, where there's a female candidate who's equally qualified that, that they will be given preference and there's you know positive discrimination in some areas. It's at the lower levels where you mentioned earlier where admin areas or security or drivers or whatever, that there's still those um, societal norms that, that dominate. And I think it's just um, by using um, the experience of colleagues like my friend Grace in Uganda, um, that break those barriers and that um, that show that it, it, it's not about gender. It's just about having the right person in the right job um, that we can we can continue to, to work toward that. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you for your insight um, in gender. We're going to give you a last parting question and we're going to actually ask you about one of the UN myths that people seem to believe and people seem to ask. And we wonder if you can dispel this myth for us or confirm. Is it true that you don't pay taxes? <laughs> oh my goodness, if I had a penny for every time um, somebody asked me that question, or, or most people don't ask me that question, most people just assume that we don't pay taxes. Um, it's true that we don't pay taxes as you, you know, if you're a private person working in a, in a private um, organization and, and uh, you pay national tax and whatever. However, there is such a thing as staff assessment, which um, goes to your country of origin. So there's a gross, your gross pay, and then there's a staff assessment taken off it, and that goes to your country of origin, and that's then taken off the dues to their, that country's dues to the United Nations. Um, but the, the point about us not paying taxes directly to a state is that no country should benefit the United Nations. So no country can collect taxes from United Nations workers. We're international civil servants. We're not Swiss civil servants or Senegalese civil, civil servants or whatever. We are international civil servants. So any taxes should go to the benefit of the United States, not to any individual member state. Um, and equally, because we don't pay taxes directly to the, the, the duty station in which we work, we don't benefit from social security systems, unemployment, healthcare, pensions, and we have our own internal UN, UN um, systems for that. So it, it, it's not incorrect to say that we don't pay taxes, but it's not, but we do make contributions um, in, in different ways. Um, I hope that's clear enough. I guess so. Maybe I'll have to ask my accountant. <laughs> but um, uh, Tanya, that's been uh, this couple of minutes with you has been great, and I hope that's provided some inspiration and some um, uh, good tips for our some of our audience. And I just wanted to ask our other panel members if they had any questions to Tanya or any comments to make more on the issue and the topic of gender before we move to the next speaker. I see no raised hands. Um, maybe they'll come a bit later, Tanya, but so far, thank you very much for your contribution to this session and um, um, we hope you stick around. Um, I will indeed. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tanya. T um, my lovely co-moderator, Jasmine, I'm going to hand on the microphone to you um, for our next speaker. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, my next set of questions are directed to Veronique. Um, and uh, the experiences of working at UN is sometimes um, so amazing to hear when you meet people working. But I'm sure there's a different uh, side to the story. As we always say, grass is greener on the other side. So my first <laughs> question to you, Veronique, is uh, can you uh, tell us of any one strange thing that you have had to do at work? Is yeah, there thank any you, Jess. Yes, thank you, Jasmine. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, and I, what comes to my mind is, uh, it's actually, a, it's a strange situation. About two years ago, I had a, 
a dear colleague here in Montreal who uh, was Belgian, and he unfortunately passed away from cancer. And um, I was asked by uh, by my administration and, and the parents of those, this gentleman who was 53 years old, and it was absolutely a very sad story. Um, he had uh, his parents and, and uh, were so desperate and so, uh, so completely devastated um, that he had to, to go so fast and so early in his life that they asked me to help uh, them to organize his funeral and the repatriation of his body. And I'm like, oh my God. So this, this colleague uh, was Belgian, of course he's French speaking. And uh, uh, like me, he had been uh, raised as a child in Senegal. I, I was born in Senegal and uh, his parents also had uh, worked for one of the UN agencies in, in Senegal. So we had this natural bonding. So, but of course I had never organized funeral for a colleague and I, I, I had no idea, but luckily I found a funeral home here in Montreal where they used to uh, repatriation of bodies because you, you might be surprised, but there's a lot of administrative steps to take and certification and authorizations to get and et cetera. And then you have to, you know, I had also no idea that the size of the coffins in, in Belgium or Europe are smaller than here in North America. So th this type of things, and it was actually, uh, of course, you know, a learning experience, but I did it with a lot of uh, a lot of fondness for his parents who actually his dad, uh, this gentleman's dad was actually reminding me a lot about my 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 own father, who was like the same you know type of person. And he was so, so interesting, but uh, it was a very strange situation to uh, to have to organize uh, the funeral of a dear colleague, you know, it's uh, but as an expatriate, you know, you are UN staff and then you are uh, posted in another duty stations and and these events in your life you know it can be a birth but it can so be a death happens and then you know we're all naturally human beings so if you, whether you are outside of your own country you know you have to have a support system to uh, to also help you go through those difficult moments so I was actually very happy to have contributed to uh, to, to this this uh, this event and and then make it uh, so we had a funeral uh, ceremony here in Montreal, which I also helped organize. And then after that, the body was repatriated. And then the gentleman's wife was a, a, a lady from um, Nicaragua. And since I also speak Spanish, so for me, it was also very good to be here to, to comfort her and then be supportive to her. So I, I was very happy about that part. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vero. That was a, really a beautiful gesture on your part, but I'm sure it must also have been one of the toughest thing to do because yeah. it takes a whole lot of strength to deal with such a situation. And mm. um, we need to let go of our uh, inhibitions and ensure that the other person uh, is uh, feels that they are in the safe hands or they feel comfortable with our gestures. So yes. it, was, it was really wonderful. And thanks for sharing that experience. Thank moving, you. <laughs> moving over to the next question, Vero. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a question raised by one of our guests, Veshnavi uh, mm -hmm. Singh. She's from India and a college student. And she's been actively part of all the MUN programs. So she has asked, how do you manage to pronounce the name of diplomats who come from different parts of the world having different pronunciations of <laughs> words and accent? Oh, interesting question indeed. Well, it is true that, you know, we, we all coming from different parts of the world and we all have a name. And I always thought, you know, a name is a name. So I personally, you know, I have, you know, for somebody who's not French speaking, maybe my last name in particular can be uh, complicated. So I think my approach is the following. Very often people who work for the UN, they speak more than one language. So that usually is a little easier because they, because you, you, you have learned different languages or so you know different sounds and pronunciations. So that, that usually helps. But my approach is that when somebody is new, I carefully listen to how he or she introduces himself. He says, you know, I'm Veronique, Alain. So I listen carefully how the person is pronouncing it and I try to to imitate and then and pronounce it in that way. But, but you know, you get your name is, is often uh, not pronounced the right way. And you have to be, you have to accept, you know, that these, these are, these things happens just for you to, to laugh about it. You know, often um, I get in my work because I organize a lot of international conferences and then by email, I get, I get, I get called dear Alan or dear Allah. So I'm saying, wow, I'm God. <laughs> you know, they call me Allah. <laughs> so, 
it's 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 a difficult part, but uh, it, it can be done. And then again, you know, I think people who work for the UN, uh, I think colleagues can 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 confirm that uh, the other colleagues who are on the panel can confirm that you you are you accept that your name might not be pronounced properly, but you you try to make an effort because it can be it can be a little bit um, uncomfortable if your name is not uh, pronounced properly, but you have indulgence, you know, you think, well, the person doesn't speak the language necessarily, so you you accept, you know, that it's part of, of, of it. But when you have to spell your name for the email, I have developed all kinds of tricks, you know, so I go and I say V as, yeah, and then, and then I lived in different countries, so I also have learned how to spell my last name, in particular in the different languages, like in German, I can do it in Spanish, in French, in English. So you you develop those tricks also to to make sure that your name is properly spelled, because with the emails, it's very important. So um, I, I don't know if I have replied extensively, or, or, but I think this is how I go about it. but you have we all make an effort i think thank you over to you thank you so much Vero, for that for that insight i think it's the same with everyone while shakespeare said what's in a name i think you mispronounce someone yeah. else's name and they'll get and we'll get to know what's in a name apparently because yes. <laughs> my, my my surname is uh j-o-s-e which is jose in spanish and in jose, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and in india it's joe's so often it's confused oh. so when i'm dealing with different nationalities it does come into play and then i'm like okay it's accepting you know it's accepting but some people uh need me uh, like as you mentioned we need to hear the way they pronounce their names or introduce mm -hmm. themselves to get a better association so moving over yes. uh, since uh, climate since uh, dealing with the climate is one of the important sustainable development goals that the UN mm -hmm. has in its mind. Uh, the question is uh, that the UN has been criticized for contributing to climate change due to their traveling. Uh, how important do you think it is for the UN to walk their own talk? Mm. Well, it's not, not the, an easy question. Actually, Peter could reply better than me, I suppose. But because, uh, yeah, it's true that uh, the, the UN uh, does or was traveling a lot before the COVID, of course. Uh, and, and in some instances, it's true that that uh, there could be better uh, uh, analysis, whether it's really important to travel to this place or to, to that other place for attending conferences that might be organized in different settings. Uh, the UN is true. You should should lead by example and and uh, and try to uh, avoid you know having to to take the plane too often and and for not not urgent reasons when it's 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 the case. I think it's it's a it's a work in progress. You know the the UN is walking the talk, but it's, it always takes a lot of time and and then it's always it's it, these are baby steps and then it, we have to keep talking about about the the subject and then. Uh, you know, the, the the UN then will, in the end, they will make better decisions. And I'm, I'm hopeful that after this, this uh, pandemic situation, you know, things have become more uh, in perspective. And I think uh, most of the UN organizations and the, the heads of the organizations have realized that uh, maybe negotiations can happen in a different way or in a different manner, and it can be uh, a better incentives to, to, to protect our planet and make it less uh, less damaging. Um, so it, there's still a lot of work to be done. I agree uh, in the UN in particular, but I'm also hopeful that this this pandemic, I think, as I said, has changed so much the way now we operate in general. So this there might be. I'm I'm also confident that they there will be a different approach in the coming years or so. So that uh, our impact on the the planet will definitely be uh, better uh, and and less uh, less important. Um, so I I will stop there because uh, I don't want to get into too too many technical details which I I am not aware of. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Vero, for that. Um, so <clears throat> to end. Uh, uh, it's it's the last question that I would like to ask you is because 
often uh, most of us have faced a situations when we want to run into uh, a grocery store to buy a last to have a last minute purchase and the moment we come back we see our cars being towed away because they have been parked in the wrong places so mm-hmm. i just wanted to know um it's a it's a myth that revolves that can you park your car anywhere and not have to pay fines if it's in the wrong spot mm. no i don't I, i don't think so i mean i think if, if maybe if you have a diplomat uh, diplomat plate on your car uh, you know often there are some high level uh, un staff who have a diplomatic uh, status and they have a, a diplomat plate on their car but they are they also have spaces uh, reserved for for those cars and i i i personally believe that if you park your car in the wrong place whether you're un staff or another person you have to pay the fine you have to accept the consequences and then uh, i know for a fact that here in montreal you know as a un staff if you if you run into uh, parking in the wrong place or having a speed ticket you have to pay you have to pay your 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 fine it, it, it doesn't matter whether you are un staff or not now there is a, you know if there is a, a, a a reserved spot for for diplomatic cars then that's fine you can park there and then you will not have a fine but if you have done uh, the wrong thing whether you are un or not you, there's no <laughs> there's no difference you know there's no privileges for that as far as i'm concerned so Thank we do have to pay our fines <laughs> that's really great to know where on so the next time i think uh, this myth will be cleared for many of the people who generally uh, tend to see uh, tend to see the perspective from the different side um so thank you once again i hand over to peter to move forward for the next panelist thank you thank you very much veronique and thank you very much jasmine um we're going to go from veronique's lovely library in montreal and go to somalia in mogadishu where we have ari there um ari can we maybe we can see ari ari my first question i'm going to ask you is what brought you to the un and in particular why the field um thanks peter look um i've got to say to give some context first i think for a long time the myth or the perception i kind of somehow thought as well was the un was pretty much for um for for how can i put this international types people you know who's you know mummy and daddy were ambassadors or diplomats and stuff like that and so forth so in some ways it seemed pretty much like a place that you know a kid born in country australia would would never ever work for or end up in um in my 20s i had seen somewhere in the back of a magazine somewhere saying hey um are you under a certain age do you have these qualifications why not sit the un exams um so I gave it a shot, and to my surprise, I was invited for the exams. Eight hours worth of exams, I should say. I somehow passed that, and then got to the next stage, which was a two-hour panel interview. Somehow, I filled them and passed that as well. And then, of some months afterwards, I uh, I got into to the UN through what was then the exam system. Basically, it was to, meant to create a backbone of junior, long-term career uh, UN officers. uh to to work for the UN um so that's how I got into the UN like like I said for me it I still pinch myself thinking that that I am here and that I'm doing what I'm doing um I think the second part of your question was about the field did I did I get that right yeah we I uh, wanted to know particularly like did you choose to or what what attracted you to the work in the field look i mean but some of the colleagues here i i heard uh, I, i understand have had 20 years in some duty stations and so forth I mean I should point out that everyone has a different unique experience. Uh, I have one friend for example who did as a librarian for the was a librarian for the UN. Worked in Bangkok, Geneva, then New York, then resigned went back to Australia to raise a family. Um other colleagues have spent years and years in the one location so there is no one way right way wrong way it depends on everyone's circumstances. In my case I always felt that um for me in communications it helped to be able to talk about what the UN does across the whole range of UN experiences i began in the uh, the sg's spokesperson's office i still pinch myself about that and i've worked since then in lebanon 
Sudan, one country, Sudan, Lebanon, West Africa, Afghanistan, Somalia a few times now, and Bangladesh and Thailand as well. Um, but my approach has always been that I think it made me a better UN official or officer or civil servant having the experience of, of not just doing in some ways, if I can be you know, a bit sort of cliched about it, the paperwork in a headquarters duty station, but also seeing the people that we actually help on the ground. And this includes the Ebola mission in West Africa, includes Lebanon after the 2006 uh, war with, the, with Israel, and, and very, and a set of Somalia and Afghanistan as well. So for me, it just seemed like you know, to join the UN and not be able to do the, have these experiences and do this and see with my own eyes, um, it, I think it helps make me a, a better communicator about the UN's work having this experience. Don't get me wrong, there are days I say to myself, what the hell am I doing in a place like this? But you know, those days come and go, of course, I think for all of us, no matter where we are, um, but but I, I I I do enjoy on some level being out in these places, the history, current affairs, also to be able to as I said experience local cultures as well. Although it can vary because in some places like Somalia or Afghanistan, we live in fortified compounds because of the security issue. So it can vary. I hope that makes sense. I rambled a fair bit there. Your rambling is perfectly sensible and um, really appreciate you taking the time to be able to um, bring some of that experience to our audience and um, let them understand that, yeah, we're not all um, UN people sit in um, New York headquarters and photocopy and um, send faxes the whole day, but actually there are people that are doing other things like yourself. Um, uh, I mean, it's very inspirational, very also admirable what you've done, the places that you've been in, you just, you've just told us. Um, and I guess probably as a child, you don't sort of say, oh, I want to go and work in Afghanistan. I'm going to work on a bowl when I grow up. <laughs> so is there any tips that you could give our audience about, you know, how to approach or you're looking at studies or um, how to get into, I mean, you've mentioned your path, um, but I imagine there might be other ways of people to enter the UN workforce. Um, any tips for that on that? Well, Peter, just to your first point, I actually used to be a journalist before the UN. So I was always keen from a young age and I liked my history and travel books and everything else to go to these places, as crazy as, as it is. Um, um, but now in terms of tips, like I said, there, there is no one way, but I would say if you're under a certain age, under the age of 32, um, most of the UN entry level professional jobs tend to be under that age group. I would say you should aim for the national exams. Now it can vary, it depends upon your country being invited to sit the exams. So there's that aspect too. There's also the aspect of the one, they want a master's degree at least normally and X amount of years of experience. But I, I recommend the uh, UN exam way because it really is, if you're a, a young person at this age, it really does mean um, you, you enter in a very, can I say, in a very pure way because the exams are done in a way in which there's no name, there's no nationality, there's nothing that gives it away. It's purely based on your pure merit of passing the exams. And the actual contract you get afterwards is quite, you know, given the, the precarious UN contract situation, it is a pretty decent contractual system that it sets you up for as well. And, and it does expose you to, from, a, from a, a young age to a lower level of the UN to different parts of the UN. And in terms of being able to move around in the UN, most of the uh, jobs happen to be at those junior to mid-level parts of, of, the job, of, the, of the job structure. So you do get to bounce around and really experience uh, those sort of entry-level jobs um, a lot more of the UN system. Now, it's a pyramid, so as you go up the pyramid, there are less jobs, less senior roles to, to have, and most of those tend to be in headquarters sections anyway. So um, tips would be take a long-term approach it's not going to happen overnight. You have to keep at it. Who um, Google, search around websites, see what the UN wants in young people entering the UN to, to find out and fit those profiles. Um, and three, uh, be patient. Be very patient uh, because it takes a long time to one to get in. And once you do get in, even then to onboard takes a long time as well. And I'm sorry, fourth also, if you speak another language, I think uh, either Vera or, 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 uh, or, um, or one of my other colleagues mentioned it well, another language always helps. Very good. And I know that you're a polyglot yourself, um, speaking several languages. Um, 
I wanted to ask you now when we're looking at, um, okay, someone wants to join the UN and there's the field where you, you've been at extensive experience and there's those headquarter jobs. Could you give us a feeling of like um, one of the highlights for you working at the UN, you know, in particular working in the missions? What, what would you say are your takeaways to say this is the reason why you want to sign up? Again, it can, it can depend on the UN job you have. I mean, I began in the spokesperson's office under Kofi Annan. So, you know, as a, as a young fellow working in, you know, in, in close proximity and traveling with him as well, it was a real like pinch myself sort of experience. Um, so, and to be able, again, in a very junior minor way, to be a fly on the wall for Security Council consultations, um, historical moments, for global affairs is amazing. Um, and also at UN headquarters in New York, you can imagine just, I mean, you know, to work at a place you see on postcards, it can, can be quite trippy. So, uh, um, so, so it's, it's, it's that sense of, wow, being part of something bigger and something that's doing good for the world is, is a nice feeling to, to go about your work, having that, that in the back of your head. Um, but again, for the field, I think the highlights there would be one, you're away from headquarters because there are pros and cons to everything. Headquarters can be a bit, as I said earlier, a bit paper pushing in some, to some degree, more of the high level stuff, which is removed from the people you're helping. Um, so field experience is, again, you're seeing the people you're actually helping and depends on what you're doing, actually interacting with them. I think back to uh, Sudan when it was one country before it became uh, two, two separate countries. Uh, going somewhere down in the south to, to hold a town hall meeting in, in, a, in a regional city there. And there was myself, a German fellow, um, maybe an American, someone from I think either Japan or somewhere in Asia as well. And you land somewhere and just seeing people's response to thinking, hang on a sec, here we are, middle of Africa, in, in, in southern Sudan at the time, and here we are, and we see these foreigners coming here to help explain what the world is doing to help us in that situation. And that sort of energy when, when people see, hang on, like, you know, we're not forgotten. The world cares about what's happening here and what we're doing and so forth. Um, is, is a really, again, you helping in some minor way that part of the, the world. That's also, a, to, to, to be cliched about it, it's also a, a, you know, good for the soul to know that you're doing something that actually helps make this crazy world a better place. Um, I, I go back to something someone told me once. I could do what I do for a private sector company, get paid big bucks and whatnot, but for me personally, I wouldn't have the same sense of like, hey, you know what? Wake up today, do something positive, help push the needle forward to make the world a better place. So the field, I think, has that aspect in a much more vibrant way of helping change things, hopefully for the better on the ground. Oh, that's great inspiration and I, oh, there, goes, there goes my UN flag. I have a, we have a question coming in from the audience and I wanted to ask and it's um, probably looking at the flip side of what you've just been mentioning. Um, and we've got someone who's asked, um, one second, I've just, um, have your question here. Um, looking at, um, there's a, a, an audience member who's asked about wanting to know about the processes that you'd go through in suffering that you experience yourself for places like Afghanistan or Nepal, you know, where there's earthquake re relief work um, and sometimes it's difficult to process such emotions and things like this that you, you are confronted with on it, maybe not a daily basis, but probably more often than someone sitting in headquarters. So how do you deal with that emotional um, torment that you would be going through dealing with and seeing people in suffering situations and things? Look, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. Um, I, think <laughs> okay. you look, I think you have to accept that, that, that if you come somewhere like someone in the field, like, and again, there are different grades of field uh, missions. There are some that are quite moderate where you live in the, with the public, with the, with the people of the, of the country. Others like here, where you live in a compound that has thick walls for, for mortar blasts, ramp shells. Um, you know, if you see behind me, you see a, there's a blue helmet there and on the ground there's my body armor uh, in case for an attack, for example, when I go see the minister uh, in, in the inner city uh, before COVID-19, that is, um, I would go in a convoy, armored convoy, 
uh, wearing, I said, body armor, helmets, and everything else. Um, you live in quite cramped conditions. Most colleagues here will, you know, live in in, in shipping containers that have been converted. Uh, there isn't much to do. The food can be quite awful. Um, so, and you can get a bit cooped up. To give you an example of just how how tough it can be, uh, when I was in Afghanistan, there was an R and R a leave cycle every six weeks um, to get out and just decompress because you're kind of on edge half the time. Uh, here, the R and R cycle is every four weeks. Uh, at the moment, I've been here for three months straight. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it's an experience. But I think you don't come to these places um, without being open and ready for this sort of experience. I mean, I always say if you're not if you can't deal with stress, maybe you shouldn't come into a, a hardcore uh, field mission because it, it, it is quite stressful, stressful in its own way. Um, so to answer the question in a nutshell, I think you, you don't come out here um, not knowing this to some degree and you have to be ready for it. And you have to find ways that, that work for you in terms of how to cope with the stress. For example, uh, we can walk out on the shoreline here, which is protected by, we have a, a green zone where you're kind of more or less away from possible terrorist attacks to some degree. Um, you, you know, so people go out for an afternoon job or a morning walk. Um, you know, you read a lot. You know, you, you you find ways to cope with these rather unusual and somewhat stressful living conditions. Um, otherwise, especially I said, especially because um, it can get quite intense. So I, I've had colleagues hurt from mortar attacks. I've had colleagues killed in terrorist attacks in Afghanistan and so on. Um, so you, you really do have to accept that this is in some ways the sharper edge of the UN's work um, and, 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 you know, find ways that you can deal with it up here, but also in here and with your family as well. I hope that made sense. De definitely, definitely. Thank you. Um, great, um, great response. I'm going to ask you a parting question and it's so got to do with um, the idea of peace. Um, you're in um, peacekeeping, but we're looking more at internal peace and within the UN itself. You know, the UN is a family of different cultures, of different perspectives, and people have different opinions. Um, do we get to the point where, you know, that sort of peace is, you know, at stake internally at the UN? And um, how do we one maintain that internal peace when you're under those stressful situations? Look, I mean, you, you got to keep in mind that this is bringing so many cultures from the world together on top of individuals' own ways of dealing with, with conflict and so forth in the in a sort of confined office space. Um, so it can vary. I've heard some horror stories. I mean, you know, don't forget the you know, UN staff are humans too. So I've heard some horror stories about bosses who impose their will or don't treat staff the right way, which leads to more conflict and so on. Um, you know, I, I've been lucky by, by having quite good bosses, but I've also learned from my not so good bosses so that I try to treat my team, you know, my staff members uh, in a way that I want to be treated. I mean, yeah, just common sense, I would say, to some degree. Um, so I try to you know, think, OK, how did I not enjoy being treated when I was a junior officer by, by my bosses? Do the opposite in that case. Um, but also, I would say beyond that sort of personal individual approach, there's also the fact that you know, the UN has some pretty strong guiding principles and values. And I think as staff members, we should all, and we, we do try, hopefully, to, to you know, live by, those, by those, those values and principles, not just with the people we help outside, but also with our colleagues in, in this you know, rather trying circumstances, so that, you know, that those values are kind of infused with, um, with you know, how we treat each other. But again, I almost go back to that much more basic level of like and what's common to most religions in the world is, you know, treat others as you want them to treat you, basically. So I think that should underpin pretty much most of our interaction with, with, with each other, the world, not just the UN, not just people who we help in the UN, but just human beings in general. Adi, this has been great. I really appreciate this chat and I hope that our audience also has gained some tips and perspectives about what it's like to really work in the field. Um, I just wanted to check with my my other panel members if anyone's got a question for Adi or anyone would like to raise anything or add to anything about peace and working on the field. Please take the floor. Peter, I'll add one last thing to what I was saying as well oh, in sure. case there are no comments. Just basically, um, the thing about 
intense field work is that you do end up appreciating things outside here a lot more. Um, whether it's food, whether it's friends' company, whether it's family, whatever it may be, you have a different appreciation. And I'll give you one quick example is that, for example, I'll, I'll be back in Australia in a, in a, with a friend in a car driving and they might you know, flip out over the traffic and it's terrible and start screaming and going, going off, off their nut, basically. I tend to say, hey, this is your biggest complaint today that we have some pretty bad traffic that might take a while. And this is Australia. It's not, not even like traffic in Beirut or Mexico City. This is your biggest complaint today that the traffic, trust me, it's a bloody good day. <laughs> As a fellow Aussie, I can concur. That would be a bloody good day for someone like you working on the field. Um, I see that my panel, our other colleagues have um, not raised any questions for you. I think they want to make sure that you get some um, R&R &R yourself. Thank you so much. Um, please stick around for the final round when we get your final comments. Thanks, Ari. Um, Jasmine, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for handing over to me. Uh, the next panelist is Dr. Rajesh, and uh, we have some interesting questions for him. Uh, some general and some myth, as uh, and some related to his work. So. Okay. I would like to begin, uh, <laughs> Dr. Rajesh, uh, with a question. Um, when was it at the time of in your career when you felt at the peak of your career or made you like, you know, it was the highest moment for you at the UN? Mm. Okay, but uh, before I attempt this, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, you, Peter, Georges, Keshav, uh, who are running this event for us. And uh, you have helped us to put a human face to the UN system today, uh, the 75th birthday of the UN. And uh, we are so happy to be connected with all the young people which you have uh, put, on, put us in touch with. And they all represent a future potential that UN could aspire for uh, and achieve uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, I believe that we are, I am quite proud to be a component of a big global system and cherish the opportunities I have got to serve and contribute to the humanity and the planet in our small ways. Uh, so I also want to take a moment today to express my heartfelt grief for those UN colleagues uh, who lost this, who we lost this year in line of duty uh, we have seen some uh, unfortunate uh, attacks and deaths uh, before pandemic, but a few of them have actually lost their life uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so I would certainly uh, remember them uh, and, and many of, some of them have lost their family members as well. So coming back to the question, uh, you know, as a, as a health, uh, health uh, person or, or, a, or a doctor, uh, you know, one could aspire for working in the World Health Organization, which is a technical uh, specialized agency of the United Nations uh, as, a, as a pinnacle of career. Uh, but I didn't come to WHO to make a career. I spent uh, my 25 years in uh, <coughs> healthcare uh, in the government uh, sector in India. And uh, then I uh, entered this public health domain uh, for uh, some reasons. Uh, so, so that's one high point in my own personal career, uh, but in my UN career of last 15 years, I would say uh, the highest point I have seen is uh, when my region, uh, which is the Southeast Asia uh, region of uh, the WHO, uh, when uh, we got certified for being polio free. In <clears throat> so, so I was here and I cherished uh, that moment. Uh, and remembered that uh, it was 1994 uh, when uh, the first attempts in India <clears throat> were made to eradicate poliomyelitis. So region had started uh, in few countries, but India started in 1994 uh, when the current Union Health Minister of Government of India, Dr. Harshwardhan, uh, was the state health minister in the state of Delhi. And I was in the government at that time, a pediatrician by training and profession. And uh, we launched the first pulse polio campaign in Delhi in 1994. It was so successful because of the work which all of us did, the community, the, all the religious, political, and 
community leaders, 95% of children less than five years were reached uh, by two drops of polio in their mouths. So such a big uh, effort in a state of Delhi, which was at that time around uh, two crores of people or, or, or 20 million of them. <clears throat> and uh, to reach out to those families, uh, horrendous, uh, this uh, humongous effort. effort. 1995, the government of India recognized the benefits and the feasibility. And since then we have had national pulse polio uh, program going on. Uh, it took us 11 years, almost, uh, or, or 10 years. Uh, and uh, in 2011, actually, uh, we, we reached uh, a last case of uh, polio was actually identified uh, in India. And uh, India had to wait for two years for certification by the WHO committee. And 1993, uh, India was declared polio free. And the region, therefore, in 2014, uh, was announced as polio free region. And now out of six regions, only one small place, uh, there is wild polio circulation. Uh, if we did not have COVID, we could have seen uh, this polio, the scourge of uh, paralysis in children uh, would have been ended from this planet in a couple of years. I can't predict now because of this COVID pandemic. Uh, but you know, uh, these are rare instances when, when we can claim a victory uh, like uh, smallpox was eradicated in 1978. I don't think many of the people who are linked to the call today would even remember what smallpox looks like. Uh, but it had killed millions of people. And in 1978, I was just about finishing my MBBS uh, course in, in, a, in a college in Delhi uh, when we heard that the, the world has uh, banished smallpox from this planet. Uh, so rare opportunities to, to be there. Uh, but I can certainly personally relate to polio eradication in this region uh, as a personal high point in my career. Uh, thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Rajesh, that uh, I'm sure uh, not only has it been the highest point of your career, but for everyone who's uh, acknowledged the fact that uh, such a big uh, large scale program was initiated and it was successful. Moving on, uh, since you mentioned that some of your plans were stalled due to the pandemic, our next question is related to it. So how has uh, COVID impacted public services? In particular, have civil servants felt changes in working conditions? You know, uh, this is once in a century kind of event. Nobody was actually prepared for such a catastrophic pandemic. Uh, so we can't blame anyone, but we should have been better prepared uh, as uh, there is always an opportunity uh, to deal with this situation. And, uh, you know, we have been uh, uh, quite now uh, trying to be on top of this pandemic. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic uh, is, is because of a highly infectious and a novel virus, uh, which, is, which has been unknown. We didn't know about this. And uh, what has happened is, that uh, the, the, the sudden uh, pandemic uh, with a lot of uh, curfew-like situation having been adopted because of uh, the need to isolate people uh, and uh, suddenly uh, we had uh, to, to work from home. As Tanya was saying, uh, that many of us actually uh, were, were forced to, to start working from home uh, without much uh, preparation. Uh, so, uh, we have adopted the new and different ways of working already, uh, mainly working from home. Uh, so, the civil servants, the international civil servants, as much as the national civil servants, uh, there was a time when most of them or most of us were working from home, uh, you know, based on the public health advice that you don't venture out. And because of the host government's, you know, conditions, uh, their, their, their local public health uh, advice, uh, that we had to start working from home. Uh, so field conditions were especially challenging. Uh, there are critical functions uh, within the UN system as much as within WHO, uh, which must be continued. So therefore I'm so uh, proud that my colleagues who are in those crit critical functions, people like Ari and Vero who look forward to, you know, who, who take care of field conditions. Uh, so they were able to perform even during the pandemic. Uh, their routine uh, uh, work and services with courage, uh, responsibility, and uh, commitment. Uh, 
so so they, they, there have been a lot of demands on us uh, as international civil servants uh, we certainly we did adopt uh, technology to work remotely as i told you uh, many of us from our duty stations but some of us were actually at their hometown locations uh, when they got stuck and had started had to contribute to routine work from there uh, and uh, you know uh, but i am happy to report uh, that many of us actually most of us were able to deliver on our uh, routine work and, and in fact uh, have started spending more more than normal time uh, for office work uh, these the surveys among the un staff have revealed that during these conditions the work hours have actually extended and uh, because of the time zone differences uh, across different offices uh, for example i have a headquarter in geneva and it's the evening time when we want to do meetings with them and decide uh, what are our best steps forward for covid pandemic uh, so there is no other way but to extend my day into the evenings of uh, new delhi uh, uh, sitting here at home and then connecting with the people and many staff have reported that they found it difficult to unplug uh, from the office work uh, because of the commitment we have uh, to continue and uh, this has uh, certainly been on the cost of uh, work life balance and tanya is so right it may have affected it has affected the women staff uh, much more disproportionately uh, because you know all these men folk the children were at home and the, these ladies who work for who or the un agencies had to work for uh, their routine uh, office work and also care care for these extra people uh, staying back at home so household chores <laughs> increased the stress has increased <clears throat> so all of that is there uh, so like other uh, people who were forced to work at home uh, outside the un system uh, i think we also our our people also suffered a lot of undue anxiety Uh, and uh, stress and also some health conditions uh, which can happen if you shift from home uh, from a social uh, situation to an isolated situation it is e- already challenging but to spend most of your time on screen terrible especially at my age um, so i have to get my eyesight checked very soon it seems and there are ergonomic challenges i have we don't have uh, efficient work desks so to so many of us many of my colleagues have already been complaining of uh, back pain shoulder pain uh, neck pain uh, because of uh, those issues so so it's not just the un system i think everyone had to go through this uh, but um, we are getting used to it and i, I as i said uh, we have been able to efficiently continue to uh, to to contribute uh, our might and maybe a little more uh, than routine situation uh, thank you thank you dr rajesh so just um, commenting upon what you mentioned uh, regarding the changes so do you think that the reliance on digital working systems and communication cha- uh, technologies will also bring about uh, further changes in the un work systems in the future as well or is it just limited to the pandemic only you know this dependence on technology for good reasons uh, has been there for some time it is another matter that the pandemic has accelerated uh, the use of uh, this size in information communication technology uh, faster than we had hoped uh, we are adapting to that uh, but certainly there would be lasting changes as much as in the economic world or the or the other sectors of work uh, so much in the un system as well Uh, so uh, we had uh, experimented and some of the un agencies had already started experimenting uh, with the teleworking option uh, which is uh, working remotely uh, not necessarily going to the office physically uh, with some good effect people were already doing that uh, but uh, certainly that process has been accelerated uh, so it with some good reasons i think it will last beyond the pandemic uh maybe for uh, comparative efficiency uh, on uh, carbon footprint for example uh, we, we might evaluate and uh, find out finally that if out of 100 people uh, only 50 are working uh, together on a day uh, in a building which is supported by by uh, power demand and all that uh, and then the travel which which includes uh, further spending of fuel 
uh, and then parking space and all that uh, would ease off if we if we evolve uh, methods of uh, staggering our people in the office spaces and uh, and doing a hybrid or a combination approach of working from home and adopting a hub and spoke office model for example a hub could be at the headquarter at, at a station and spokes of uh, co-working spaces uh, in satellite offices uh, in various business cities who could look at some of the options and some and un as well uh, generally most un agencies there are business cities uh, beyond their headquarters so you could uh, look at those options where uh, some of the staff could be located there uh, and work uh, in, in in co-working spaces uh, maybe we could work with the universities and institutions who like a technical agency uh, we do a lot of research why not host our people in uh, known universities and research institutions and we could just uh, make it more efficient uh, so there these are the options which who is considering presently and we would certainly like to redesign our existing offices and modernizing uh, the the current spaces uh, to be less strainful on 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 uh, environment or climate uh, as we discussed uh, the footprint on climate of even staff uh, so we could uh, certainly look forward to uh, better uh, you know outcomes with the same efficiency of work uh, so i hope uh, uh, we learn from this pandemic we certainly want uh, to to make use of this uh, this as an opportunity uh, to strengthen to improve our work and uh, not just in un but in governments in other sectors uh, i would call upon people to to let's to let's st start building back better uh, let's build back better uh, than what we were before the pandemic and let's build better and equal uh, so that equity is continuously our focus uh, during the pandemic as much now but in the future as well so my young colleagues especially i would want them to help us to build back better and equal thank you thank you so much dr rajesh it's been wonderful interacting with you um i is there anyone from the panel who would like to comment on the questions directed to dr rajesh if not then uh, we would like to move ahead and i hand over to peter to go on with the next panelists. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jasmine. And also thank you very much, Rajesh, for your insights and um, telling us about the work that you do at the WHO. I now have um, Gemma and um, Gemma comes from the Philippines and she's working in Geneva and I've known Jenna for a couple of years. Um, and as mentioned before, she was the general secretary of FIXA um, when I was also in the executive board. Gemma, pleasure to have you here. Um, Gemma, why don't we cut to the, the myth that we've heard and the latest news that we've had um, that the World Food Programme has just won the Nobel Prize and um, we wanted to know more in detail, I mean, is this the first prize that the UN has won and could you tell us a bit more about the UN and Nobel Peace Prizes? Hi, Peter. Uh, once again, thank you for having me. Um, we are so thrilled that um, the World Food Program won the Nobel Peace Prize this year. As you may have heard, um, you know, we heard in the grapevines and actually in the news as well that WHO was one of the contenders. But when they announced that it was WFP, we from WHO were very proud and happy for um, proud of and happy for WFP. And for the UN, this is actually the 12th uh, Nobel Peace Prize for the UN. So since 1950, there's been several agencies and people from the UN who have won. Uh, for example, uh, Kofi Annan in 2001, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, the first uh, UN Secretary General won, that was in 1961, UNHCR, UNICEF, ILO, uh, UN Peacekeeping Forces, uh, actually OPCW and uh, IAEA. So it's been a history of uh, wins. And because we're part of, you know, we're a sister agency, um, yeah, we're proud for them. 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. I mean, that is a lot of acronyms that you gave out there to the audience. I think we'll have to provide them a glossary of um, all those different UN agencies that exist and all the different acronyms that they have. But yeah, a very long history um, and very good news um, to hear that the UN again has won a, a Nobel Peace Prize and well deserved. Looking at winning a Nobel Peace Prize, I mean, that comes with a lot of hard work. Can you tell us, Jim, what is the hardest part of your job? Um, the hardest part actually of my job is uh, walking the talk every day um, because we're international civil servants. So like we are supposed to represent the organization, so WHO uh, and the UN in general, 24 seven. That means I cannot just be Gemma, you know, goofy, uh, very uh, mischievous Gemma in my, you know, days off. I have to like be careful with what I say, what I do, because I represent the organization. I represent the UN. So for instance, um, uh, there's this uh, election right now um, in the US, you know, my friends, my family, by the way, it's very divided, you know, and so sometimes I just want to forward or comment or laugh or whatever it is, you know, uh, in, in Facebook, you either like, love, and sometimes you're laughing and whatnot. I'm very careful. I don't even say anything. I don't comment. And I have very, very strong personal opinions, but I don't let that be shown in my social media account. It's just really very cognizant because you don't know. And, you know, Google they, and Facebook, they, somebody can track what you said, like maybe 10, 12 years down the line when I'm, you know, applying for something or whatnot, or, or even the following Monday when I go back to work. So you see, I'm always very careful. And uh, for instance, uh, I was, I did a Santiago Compostela pilgrimage for 34 days. I walked almost 800 kilometers over uh, August and September. And, you know, in Spain during that time, you have to wear a mask even when you're outside. So I wasn't just only like complying because I was Gemma Vestal. I was complying because I'm like, shucks, I work, I represent WHO. And can you imagine if I get the ticket and they find out that as WHO person here walking the Compostela and not wearing a mask, so we have to give her a fine. I mean, it's just, it doesn't look good. Even if I don't get in trouble at work, it's like we preserve the integrity of, because we work so hard for our credibility, our reputation. So yeah. The talk every day, twenty four seven. And I know that doesn't. That's probably very easy for you, Jim, because I know you're a good person of good integrity, and you would always wear your mask at any time. So, <laughs> um, yeah, good to know. We're going to move into some questions about inclusion, which is a theme that um, we have been um, uh, we're addressing in also these um, series. Um, could you tell us about inclusion at the UN and what it looks like? How does policy development um, in the UN system, make sure that all different perspectives are included um, in the process. Okay, so let me talk about, because I'm in policy development, health policy development, um, in terms of making sure that when in policy we're including all the perspective, that's, there's a lot of planning uh, that goes, you know, with that. So we have to make sure we have all the proper stakeholders, the stakeholders who um, need to say their voice. So we, um, if there is ever a policy that, you know, we plan with, uh, to do, we include all the regions because, you know, all the six regions of WHO, which is, you know, the Southeast Asia, you know, um, Western Pacific, the Americas, Africa, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region and Europe. And so with that already, you have the various, uh, you know, ethnicities. And then, you know, we also include the proper NGOs that are stakeholders, uh, the regulated, uh, you know, uh, group. It could be like um, uh, we would invite people who would represent, uh, for example, you know, food or milk. You know, if it's something that, you know, from a policy perspective, we really need the broadest dialogue. So that's the, the type of thing that we would, you know, make sure as we develop policy. And then if you think about 
inclusion in terms of WHO as an employer, we're actually in the middle right now because I'm still with the staff association of a WHO headquarters. We're now in the middle of a developing a policy on inclusion. So um, for that policy development, there's a lot of offices involved, you know, ethics is involved, health services involved, staff association is involved, all the general service staff is involved, uh, people with disabilities are involved, LGBT, uh, you know, groups are involved. So uh, it's really making sure that you get all the stakeholders there in the dialogue. Yes, of course, you need to get all the stakeholders in there um, to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and looking at the flip side of um, inclusion would be exclusion. And um, being in the staff association, as you said, have you um, witnessed yourself or have you had staff members come to you and talk about them feeling excluded and not being included at the UN or not feeling a part of the UN family? Uh, I've had... Um you know, staff talking to me because we, we as a staff association member, they do come to us and then we, you know, if it's really something that is beyond like a person to boss or person to colleague, uh, then we involve staff management, you know, we have a dialogue with our staff management um, group, so we bring up this issue so that it can be um, uh, addressed in a systematic uh, way, but personally, oh my god, uh, I'm I'm five feet, and I'm Asian, and so it's funny actually. I I I take it with uh you know I I can't be upset with things all the time, so I just laugh. But uh yeah, it happens quite you know frequently for me. Like they think that I'm the admin staff when I'm like you know in a big meeting, and then and then they realize when I'm in a meeting that I'm actually in the uh, the area where the panelists are and then they realize I'm not the admin staff. So it's like that. So, but, you know, you just laugh and then people realize their mistake and, you know, you just go on. Thanks for telling us your personal insights into that. Um, I'm going to um, end with um, something that has happened recently in the news and that was Pope Francis commenting on homosexuals having the right to be a part of the family. And, um, talking about creating a civil union and saying that they must be legally covered. And he also said that he stood up for this issue. How does the UN stand up for the LGBTQ community? And um, how does that look like when actually the LGBT community is not really represented in the human rights charter? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm uh, kudos to Pope Francis for doing that. I think, uh, is very brave for doing that and breaking the ranks from the like the majority of the Catholic uh, archbishops. Uh, so that's really great. Um, when it comes to the UN, the UN actually has for a long, long time, since I could remember, maybe 10, 15 years, has granted uh, or has recognized the civil union of same-sex marriages and given uh, them the, the benefits and protections like uh, you know a, a male female marriage would have, so that's that's already been uh, you know there. Uh, but when it comes to UN cha Charter, that's true. There's still more work that needs to be done than that, and you know people need to lobby their member states because uh, the member states can give a lot of pressure and has a lot of say in those things. Gemma, I really appreciate our time together and it's been really insightful and um, I've liked um, hearing about uh, your personal experiences as we tackle the topic of inclusion and also about the Nobel Peace Prize that the UN has won. Um, we'll see you later for a final round. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you. Peter. And I'm going to pass the floor back to Jasmine. Thank you so much, Peter. It was lovely listening to Gemma and the uh, uh, point where she mentioned about, uh, you know, she being looked as an admin staff because of her height and color, because I think that's, that's an instance which uh, many of us have faced. Um, I remember driving, uh, driving into a rural village in one part of India and the men staring at me as if I've committed the most grievous of crime. And they asked, uh, and from, uh, and also being questioned at times on my driving skills, 
or uh, you know because just because i happen to be a, a woman and they're like oh you drive so well or oh, really i mean you know where did you learn from i'm sure it's a man who taught you i'm like you know there's so many stereotypical notions that come out and the process of including that uh, i think you very well laid out uh, jema moving over i have my questions uh, for leda so my first question to you leila would be did you always want to work for the un and if yes why so leila you are on mute okay i guess it's been a long day <laughs> hello again everyone um thank you for the question jasmine uh I was trying to see how long I could freeze for to see if I could wake everybody up. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, I hope I got somebody out there. Being the last speaker, you got to wake people up somehow. I hope it worked. <laughs> I I can tell from Peter's reaction I got one person. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still here. Thank you for the question, Jasmine. Let me get to it now. Um, have I always wanted to work for the UN? The answer would be yes, and I'll explain why. Um, Ari mentioned in his introduction that um, the people he knew that would work for the UN were people whose parents were diplomats and ambassadors, guilty as charged. My father was a diplomat, career diplomat. He served in many countries, and um, coincidentally, being one of the strong traditional families back in the day, there was we had there are six of us. I have five siblings. Myself, I'm the sixth. and we were all born in a different country um my older brother for those of you out there who are listening i hope your geography is very good i'm about to call some countries you may not have heard of but they do exist my older brother was born in guinea conakry so country in west africa i have an older sister who is born in guinea bissau also in west africa i was born in egypt which is why i have the name leila i have a brother born in russia a sister born in the united states and the last and least was born in portugal so people always tease us that we are mini un and um it, it always whenever you hear oh united nations as a kid growing up it stays with you oh your they tell my father congratulations for your mini un so i always had the un at the back of my mind and then my father was uh, assigned to work as an electoral observer in south africa in 1994 the year when nelson mandela was elected and i do remember i wasn't very young but i won't tell you my age but i wasn't very young but i was at the age where you could be proud of what your father has achieved because you hear all oh, the world was happy nelson mandela has become president there was excitement all over the place and i kept thinking wow my dad is a superstar he oversaw that process so i wanted to also give back i wanted to be oops i wanted to bring joy to the world through my own way and unfortunately i should say my dad passed away pretty early on and he didn't really give me the tips of how to get into the system and where to get in to actually do that so i ended up coming into the un through what we call peacekeeping and i'll i'll say this because the un is different from everybody depending on what angle you come in i think we already mentioned this before jama is uh, w uh, is who we have dr Ma Ma dr one of the, our doctor panel members who we have unicef we have peacekeeping and even peacekeeping has its different arms and branches so we have um most peacekeeping um um missions are political and they have the admin support functions so if if you go to countries where there's trauma like syria now mogadishu somalia um where else let me talk about places i've served liberia um and tebe wasn't uh, difficult but and tebe had um a uh, peacekeeping stress a sector well most of these places have what we call a substantive which is the political arm and they have the support which is the administrative arm i got into the administrative arm and have okay the, the, let me not get tight track the question is have i always wanted to work for the un yes i have because of the various and the diverse people i got to meet i came in into admin support i wasn't able to do the electoral stuff but what i do now staff representative representation in my own way i am able to contribute because i support the people who do the stuff that that impacts the world and so um yes very proud very proud of what i do and i'm going to try and keep it short because i know it's been a long day and a lot of speakers have spoken but you can tell from my excitement 
always wanted to work for the UN and always hope to work for the UN. Thank you so much, Leila. I think uh, my father always used to say that when you are working for something that you are so passionate about, it reflects on your face and the way you speak about it. And I think that came truly reflecting in what you shared right now. So thank, thank you, you really, uh, real thanks to sh for sharing that. And I hope the participants who are here were as much excited hearing your experience and look forward to joining the UN and make a difference in the world. So moving over to the next question, since you mentioned about the mini UN in your family itself. So the UN staff come from different countries and from different education systems. How do you think the HR uh, looks at the academic qualifications uh, and or is there a credit, uh, is there a scoring system on which people are selected to work with the UN? Well, that's a... Good question. I will speak about recruitment from the field perspective. As I mentioned earlier in my introduction, I am a field staff representative. And again, depending where you come from, because I know UNESCO have a different way they recruit, um, UNICEF have a different way they recruit. The field, peacekeeping, um, we, have, uh, we have a computerized system. When a job is advertised, it is advertised with certain requirements education, language, experience, etc. cetera. You, you apply for the job with a document called your personal history profile, PHP. You fill out the information based on your education, your experience, your, what else do they look for? Languages, etc. you fill it out. So when you fill it out, basically your PHP gets dumped into this bucket with a million other people. And depending on the level and the requirements of the job, Obviously, if you're recruiting for a rocket scientist, we might not have as many applications. But if you're recruiting for an admin, you do have a lot of applications. So let's say we get about a thousand applications on average for a job. The, syst the, the, the system, which is called Inspira, those of you who want to check that, www.inspira.org or something like that, you can Google it, it's there. It, 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 it has a way, it, it shuffles, it evaluates your experience, it evaluates your education. And it sieves, depending on, sorry, I hope my accent isn't too difficult to understand, but depending on what you meet, the criteria you meet, it sifts it out. So it, you can't say that there's a scoring system per se, but the system has a way it checks, it weighs your experiences, your education to the experiences of an education required of the, of the vacancy announcement. And you go through what Ari initially said, a long process of, well, currently you will do once you meet the minimum requirements, obviously, you will do an assessment, a technical assessment to check if you meet the requirement, if you know the job, meet the requirements. And then we do a competency-based interview to see if you have the right behaviors and attributes and the right motivations to work in this beautiful organization. Thank you so much, Leila. I think that answered most of the questions that I also personally had because I remember filling up that PHP form, which is 11 pages long. And by the time <laughs> you end up filling, I almost, it gives me a feeling as if, you know, I just filled in a thesis or something. But I think it's a, it's a strong commitment towards ensuring that the right person fits the role. Otherwise, um, you know, it, it's going to get difficult, especially envisioning um, or aligning your goals with the UN goals takes a lot of uh, check and uh, checks, in fact. And I think that's not an easy process, even for the person sitting on the other side to ensure that the right candidate is selected. Yes. So thank you so much for that, Leila. Uh, my uh, next question is like, uh, since the world is dynamic and uh, each and every day you get um, many new changes, especially the pandemic has come in. And as Dr. Rajesh mentioned that most of us, uh, you know, we're not even, we had technical challenges because we were not used to that system of working uh, on the computer uh, most of the time. So how does UN ensure that the capacity of the workforce is up? upskilled or reskilled to be able to master the changing needs in the workplace? Okay, um, that's a good question. And thank you for whoever came up with that question. And it's perfectly addressed to me being a peacekeeping training officer. <laughs> now the UN has a training policy. The policy is uh, staff development and it not only personal, but also professional development. So um, we, we, 
I think I mentioned when I started my introduction that I, my background is actually as an accountant. And through the years, I developed and changed careers within the UN and ended up being a certified training officer. Now, I got to this point because of the UN. You, in, in our annual evaluations, we get, there's, a, there's a, a slot there that mandates a minimum five days of development per year for you. Now, some of us use more than the five days. You can get up to 20 days to do something that develops you professionally. You, the minimum is five days, but there isn't no, I, there isn't no set maximum. You can decide, and it's always, I always tell people, the learning policy is, 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 is what you make of it. It's like a tool, it's like soap. It could sit right beside you. If you don't wash your hands with it, it's not, your hands are not gonna get clean. You have to pick up the soap and use it. And so is our UN policy on training. You pick it up and you look at what you can do for yourself. We tell people, if you are in the field, if you are in a particular field and you feel like you want to do something different, because it does happen. The policy allows you to, to, look, um, to, to look for things within. We have, we, have, we have recommended training courses that develop you. You can, you can look at a course there. You can ap apply depending on the, the, the direction of your mission, the, the, the mandate of your mission. You can be allowed to do certain courses. And those courses keep you very much, um, what's the word that we're looking for? To, you were saying the able to, uh -huh, it keeps you skilled within your current area. So for example, as someone who came from an admin background, I wanted to, I wanted to work with people. I, I, I love being in a room. I love training and developing. So I, 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 I jumped at the opportunity to, to be trained. I asked my, my supervisor at the time I was working with the admin to, um, officer and I said, I, I, I think I can, I can do this. And he said, okay, if this is what you want to do, here's a course that we have available. You, you jump on it, make the most of it. And I did. And I'm proud to say I, I have within the UN been certified as a, as, as a, as a trainer. I've been certified as a, um, as a mentor and as a coach. All of this in, in, okay, I've been in the UN for 15 years, but most of this has happened in the last five years. Because the, the more you're in the system, the more you get direction, the more you realize, I told you, I wanted to save the world in the beginning. Okay, I can't save the world, but I can save the people around me. So how do I save the people around me? I become a peer helper, I become a mentor, I become a coach. So, and but that's, that's, that's personal to me. We have others who work in the field of aviation and they have to stay, uh, and um, okay, we call it move core, movement control, and they are responsible for shipping our cargoes. They have to stay relevant. They need the certificates every year, dangerous goods, um, air, sea, land, air, um, there's something else. We offer all of that to our staff. We make sure that our people, as long as they're willing, can be relevant in their various areas. I can't speak with, uh, about the, the what, are, what are they called, the mine action, the bomb people. I can speak about my people in, in, the, in, in the admin support. We have our people in finance and budget. We have our people in procurement. We've got all sorts of courses that we offer to make sure that people can be relevant and can keep maintain their skills and um, compete should they need to compete outside the UN body. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. And uh, you answered uh, one very key uh, point that I personally feel has to be implemented in the working culture is the idea of mentorship. Because uh, when I started my professional career, I know it was difficult for me to uh, find questions to many answers regarding progressing ahead with my career. And uh, when I started, I became a mentor and I started mentoring students and women uh, in the grassroots level. And that is when I realized how important it is right. to have someone to speak to who can guide you. And we had, we had that trapo sharing to a, con a point where at even at odd hours in the night, if they had any questions, they would feel free to uh, uh, ask me because they lack that kind of thing. And moving ahead, whenever I would uh, work with any companies or corporates for the CSR policies, one thing I would really ask them to do is ensure that there is an active mentoring program within their HR policy because it is something that every human being is looking forward to, especially since workplaces became a point when it became the second family, you can say. Right. workplaces became a second home for many of us and if there is a guidance if there is a mentor it helps you to progress further in life 
and helps you uh, relieve of your stress for a quite a good phase and you enjoy your working uh, spaces so thank you so much for enlightening us on that leila moving you. ahead i now hand over the floor to peter for the final comments and remarks thank you very much jasmine and thank you very much leila for a really invigorating um um uh, few moments and especially you did catch me with your frozen screen um thank you for making us all laugh um we're going to the unfortunately we're going to the final part of our our session here and um, we're going to ask each of our panel members very briefly, I think we're going to time them and give them a 45 second response. Um, we're going to go and ask them all, as we're looking at the UN celebrating 75 years, um, if they've got any comments, any wishes for the UN or anything that they would like to um, send off to our community who's been following us in, um, in remembrance of 75 years at the UN. Um, so I'm going to ask Tanya if she's... Um, available. If Tanya, you could give us in 45 seconds your wish for the UN as it's turning 75 years old. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, my uh, internet is freezing every now and again, so I'm sorry if I could have crossed you that time, Peter. Um, just what's my wish for the UN? I think it's that it stays relevant, stays um, agile, that we attract new dynamic people to come work for us, that people remain um, aware of the important work that's been done on a daily basis. And even if you're not working for the UN, that you support through your governments, through your civil society, through your everyday work, um, the, 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 the basic vision of the UN uh, to, to, to bring people together, to bring understanding to you know it's it, to remain relevant i think is basically it and i, I hope I'm, I'm like i think a lot of our staff members are and i look forward to the people who are joining us today being part of that future as well thank you very much tanya and i can only echo your words vero can you tell us um what would you wish for the un as it's approaching 75 years Thank you, Peter. You, one of my motto is in Spanish, la lucha continua. You know, the, the fight must go on in terms of the UN, I think, needs to continue to be relevant, but uh, needs to be careful not to become too politicized. And uh, I think this pandemic has uh, helped put things into perspective and will bring uh, an opportunity to make it uh, a better UN, I think. That's my, my, my hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique. Um, Ari, 75 years, what do you wish the UN? I just hope that, that yeah, young people realize that the UN isn't a bunch of fuddy-duddy, pipe-smoking bureaucrats, civil servants, desk, desk jockey types, that the UN really is, or, or needs, is young people out there to, you know, to become a part of it, to, to be inspired by it and to make it what it needs to be the future, the, the next 75 years. Great, um, I think that your words definitely have inspired us. Uh, thank you, Adi from Somalia. And Rajesh, 75 years for the UN, what do you wish for the UN? So Peter and uh, colleagues, I think we are in a dynamic world. The global order keeps on evolving and uh, we must continue to keep UN uh, as a, as a body uh, which reflects the common good and common uh, aspirations of the humanity. Uh, so we might not be able to change everyone, but I think we should change ourselves uh, to be in a position to make our world better together. So the, my hopes are on the young people. I think we will get some good feedback for this panel discussion from them, uh, but generally keep them engaged uh, and uh, attracted to serve uh, at the UN and similar agencies where they can do a common good work for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajesh. Very good wish there. Gemma, it's 75 years the UN is celebrating today. Apart from the Nobel Peace Prize, um, what else would you like to wish the UN? I just wish that um, powerful countries won't continue to politicize the UN because the UN is our hope for the future and for the 
young people out there listening, uh, I just want to remind them what you know Gandhi uh, said, that be the change you want to see in the world because our hope is also in the younger generation. Thank you very much, Gemma. <clears throat> Wise words. We're going to go to our last speaker today, the lovely Layla, who has enthralled us in the last couple of minutes. Layla, what do you wish the UN as um, we celebrate its 75 years today? Three words, I would say. The first one, relevance. I know um, Tanya already said that, but very much relevance. Prosperity. I do want to see the UN move into the future. And last but not least, to be impactful. I would, like, I would love everyone who knows of the UN to feel its impact, to know that we are here to do good and that they feel the good, not just hear of it, but that they feel it. And I mean, we don't have to be a peacekeeping mission for you to feel the impact of the UN. It's all over the world, we're everywhere. And I'd love everyone listening to be able to say one day, look back and say 25 years ago, we, we said this, and yes, today I, I can feel what the UN is doing in the world. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Leila. Very inspirational and very wise words. Um, I think all of our six panelists have really added to a very interesting dialogue that we've had, and I'm hoping that our, our audience is feeling some inspiration and um, also thinking that of today and um, acknowledging the good work that the US UN has done. And if the UN is one thing, it is its, its people, it's its staff. Um, and uh, that's where the UN gets its strength from, amongst other things. It is um, from its staff. And I think these six individuals that we've just heard from are testaments to that. Um, and uh, I commend all of them for all the great work that they do. And um, it's a real honor to have, all, have heard all from all six of them. And I'm sure that if we were in an order time right now and I could ask you all to, to um, clap and applaud them, that's what we would be doing. Um, that's hopefully one day we can do that. I'm going to now um, pass on the floor to Kishav, who should be there somewhere to say, Kishav, um, we've done what we could and now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. And, and let me firstly begin thanking you and Jasmine also for, for, such, a, for such an engaging, engaging discussion for being for creating this lovely warm space for everyone to reflect, share uh, so nicely and in, in such a great uh, sort of a, a, a com sense of community to be formed here. So thank you for being such amazing, uh, absolutely amazing uh, moderators. Le and let me also just thank Dr. Yorgos and Keith from FOGS uh, and my other colleagues who, who've been behind the scenes. Uh, but equally inspiring and uh, integral to this whole process. So uh, I won't take a lot of, a lot of everyone's time, but uh, I will make some quick remarks uh, as per what for me was the experience of listening to everyone here. Um, I felt like I was on a roller coaster ride, uh, really taking a peek into some deep insights and the way that life is in a station, for instance, or at an institution, at, at an agency from different speakers. So let me firstly thank you for opening up uh, is so truly uh, and, and really bringing out stories and, and your experiences. Uh, more Also, your advices, I think that your whatever wisdom you have shared is uh, will go a long way for anyone in any professional organization, not, I think, just young people. Uh, one observation that I have that, that I will take away from here is that uh, for me, when I started interacting with the United Nations uh, before I romanticized it and thought that it was a, a mythical place to which I didn't belong to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I thought that when I will enter the UN office for the first time, it will be very fancy in every way. And then I will just press a remote uh, remote control and the world will change when once I'm at the United Nations and I'm at that office. But, uh, but in my understanding of the United Nations and also seeing uh, through today's panelists that everyone works so hard and so professionally with so much mindfulness, with a sense of agency and responsibility that as human beings, you have all become my role models while I, I listened to you for these two hours. 
and it gives me a deep deep understanding at an insight that when we say that you and should be more compassionate i somehow am at a loss of understanding how more compassionate can you and be when the people with us are so kind and and so sincere and hard working so it makes me reassured uh, that that we are in such safe hands and that young people can take some great role models in in each one of you so my my gratitude for uh, to all of you for simply just being the fantastic human beings uh, that you have been with us uh, just one thing that i can say about uh, the utility or the relevance of the united nations uh, i would say um, i remember a speaker once talking about a comparison or an analogy of salt in the food i i'm sure you've heard it somewhere or the other earlier but he said that uh, it's like the salt um when it's in the right proportion you don't know that it's there but you start finding out that the salt is missing when it's missing from the food so similarly the role of the united nations has been that salt that is so essential in every way but we start understanding the problems that the world faces without the united nations once we start imagining what all has been achieved and prevented by this uh, by this great organization that we all uh, call the united nations uh, so so truly today uh, i i would say that we we from young people in india and i think all around the world all our partners behalf a lot of gratitude to all of you of uh, all the agencies of the united nations everyone working there and uh, and i think that at some point i started loving the blue color of the united nations and it's been such an honor to see a range of blue whether it's the it's peter's flag uh, and his shirt or dr Me- or dr mehta and, and uh, or jema's uh, jema's background or even leela's background so i feel truly truly that uh, this un day for us could not have been better and there is nothing that covid 19 pandemic can do to uh, to uh, to reduce the significance of the achievements that the united nations has had and uh, the people of the united nations have achieved as a workplace and despite the covid pandemic and the hectic jobs i know that fixa was having one of the very important weeks of these things and then today is the un day that you've all made it and made it truly in a mindful space so just thank you so much and uh, that's it i i feel very overwhelmed listening to uh, everyone and i hope uh, finally this is my call to action for the youth for all of us that in our own ways let us start finding ways in which we can support the sustainable development goals in which uh, covid-19 pandemic has pushed back uh, and created several challenges for the achievement of the sustainable development goals as we enter into the 76th year perhaps of the united nations and the un can't do this alone because we are also the un and i think today honorable secretary general has said that also on the 75th anniversary that you are the un so i feel that it is high time that all of us take it upon ourselves to feel a part of the united nations and to contribute uh, through formal mechanisms such as joining the international civil services uh, as as a speaker had said through working with the un through state uh, state or in your individual capacities through civil society just remember that the un wants a better world and wherever you do it you are in the united nations uh, and 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 certainly everyone at the un will be equally proud of you when they find out uh, what you are doing and they'll always be out there to support you so this has been my experience uh, all along with the united nations and uh, more than the trainings like personal development stuff i have learned it with the un i can personally assure you in terms of uh, any way in which professionally how things work so un is, remains uh, a dream place i think for all the youth so just my assurance in, in some sense to all our uh, speakers today that the un is very much relevant in our hearts and in our dreams as young people Uh, as a workplace as an institution and as a guiding light uh, in the coming times so thank you so much once again and have a great time ahead and our um, gratitude to all of you on this you and day thank you